Well, folks, we finally did it. We finally have a rogues gallery of creeps in the animation industry. And I am officially dead inside. Yay. Hmm. I'll be honest, I really did not want to make another video on this kind of thing. At least, I was hoping it would not become relevant again so quickly. It's only been four months since we covered What Ruined 12 Forever, and nearly a year from What Ruined Ren and Stimpy. The two videos I was foolishly hoping would be one-offs, considering the subject matter they had in common. But here we are, now with the trilogy sequel. This time with an actively developing story that is the cherry on top of this garbage Sunday. Today, we're going to be talking about Mighty Magiswords and the extensive career of the show's creator, Kyle A. Carosa. It is a story that is both worse and more complicated than the previous video iterations combined, even with a returning guest star. Uh, folks, this one is not going to be pretty. There was a lot to parse through on this one, so please know that going in. Also, in case it was not already obvious, I'm issuing a massive content warning on this one. There's a lot of really sensitive subjects involved in this video, so if any of the topics listed on the screen here are painful for you to hear about, watch this at your own discretion. I can't get into them in super graphic detail because this is still YouTube, but I want to report on the facts of the situation as much as possible. You got it? Okay? All right. With that all out of the way, let's get into what ruined Mighty Magiswords and the career of Kyle A. Carosa. But before we start, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Vessi. For the record, we are going to donate a good chunk of the sponsor to the charity Darkness to Light. Now, I have some family who work in the field of prosecuting those who commit crimes against children, and they highly recommend this charity. My relatives also helped me to research this video, so a big shout out to them. Love you all so much, and the courageous work that you do. So, summer is wrapping up, but that does not mean that these warm temps are going down anytime soon. I usually take to wearing different kinds of shoes depending on my outfits. But nowadays, I'm thinking of functionality, as well as aesthetics. It's been raining here on the East Coast, let me tell ya. Well, my new courtside classics ain't getting soggy. Uh, the city's only a stone's throw away, so when I'm down there, I can rock a nice aesthetic while staying comfortable. These new courtside classics are a court-inspired shoe with a sick aesthetic vibe and comfortable design. Its padded tongue and collar allow for effortless walks, helping me to make my strides in complete comfort. We know what city walks can be like, they're either leisurely or some kind of rock climbing expedition. I'm looking at you, San Francisco. Uh, trust me, uh, sidewalk infrastructure is crumbling, people. Uh, best be prepared with something that's not going to destroy your ankles. Uh, maybe ask the city to fund your vessies, since that tax money is not fixing these dang sidewalks. And vessies are still rocking their water resistance functionality. So with all of this rain, you can keep your shoes looking fresh as the day they arrived. With this constant weather forecast, it's going to be like freaking Venice here in the US if this rain keeps up. So if you're looking to make the most of your city life, then hit up the new Courtside Classics, scan the QR code on screen, or head to Vessi.com slash Sabrespark to check out the various styles and designs available. You'll get an automatic 15% off by doing so and acquire shoes that are made to adapt to your lifestyle. Thanks again to Vessi for partnering up with us for this video. And now, back to the downfall of Kyle. Born on May 19, 1979, Kyle Adam Carosa grew in Catskill, New York. I don't actually know if this area is considered upstate New York to the folks who actually live there, but hey, I'm sure they can still steam a good, good ham. ham. Like many kids, Kyle was obsessed with cartoons, video games, and anime. He spent his free time drawing and writing short stories, even winning a Young Playwrights Project competition in Albany when he was eight years old. Outside of drawing, Kyle learned how to play the piano and also the accordion as a teenager, initially toying with the idea of becoming a radio host like Dr. Demento, one of his musical inspirations along with Weird Al Yankovic. But his true calling was animation. 
During his teen years, Kyle took animation classes run by Brian Mitchell, a cartoonist best known for his layout work on early Spumco projects like Beanie and Cecil, along with storyboarding on 90s classics like Tiny Toons and Animaniacs. Mitchell caught on to how driven Kyle was as a worker and contacted his colleague, John McClenahan, the founder of StarToons International, an independent animation company based outside of Chicago, Illinois. StarToons had been providing supplementary animation for Tiny Toons and Animaniacs. Some examples of their work involved songs like Wacko's America and most of the Slappy Squirrel shorts, including her intro segment and one of my favorites, Bumby's Mom, where her nephew Skippy can't stop crying after watching a parody of Bambi. Bumby's mom, she's... <laughs> Have love would love this kid. <laughs> Good stuff, man. John gave Kyle a shot, having him provide uncredited in-betweens and cleanups on the Animaniacs episode Bully for Skippy. Impressed with the quality of his work, John wanted to give him a full-time job, doing contract work for the later seasons of Animaniacs as well as Hysteria, an educational cartoon for kids at WB. He also told the Red Guard to make revolution. <laughs> and they were urged to attack anyone who they what thought the might be against the government. But Kyle turned him down once he was given a full scholarship to the Art Institute of Philadelphia. College is absurdly expensive in the US, so yeah, can't argue with free money. Carosa eventually graduated with an associate's degree in animation in 1999. After that, he started working at a small software company called Funny Bone Interactive. Based in Canton, Connecticut, they created an educational and proprietary software for kid-oriented franchises like Jurassic Park, Fisher-Price, and Jumpstart. Developing software was stable work, but also boring. Kyle wanted to get back into working on the same zany cartoons he was passionate about. As luck would have it, independent animation dynamo Fred Seibert was looking for new animated short films and pilots to air on his upcoming show, Random Cartoons. It functioned as a continuation to Nickelodeon's Oh Yeah Cartoons, an anthology showcase of rising stars and new talent breaking onto the animation scene. This was just before YouTube really took off for independent animators and leveled the playing field for increased accessibility. So at the time, getting featured on an incubator network show like Oh Yeah or Random was one of the fastest ways to get your pilot picked up for broadcast television. Not wanting to miss this opportunity, Kyle moved to LA and started developing his own short film titled Moobeard the Cow Pirate about a bovine buccaneer with gadget arms and Sailor Bird, his red head counterpart. So they can finally, the treasure of Hooka Mooka Pooka Lab. A stinking bowling trophy? Well, let's take this hunk of scrap to a respected authority and see what it's worth. Old stuff roadshow! As far as animated shorts go, it's fine. If a little generic and repeats these same unfunny gags too much. There's also a blink and you'll miss a cameo of Carosa near the end as some kind of cat furry with a lady cat by his side, which, hey, you know what? That's fine. Everybody gets one obvious self-indulgent cameo if you're working on an animated project. You know, bonus points if it includes furries. Kyle provided additional voices, song lyrics, storyboarding, and character design all while co-producing it with veteran animation director Jeff DeGrandis at the helm. Jeff was also the director of Schnookums and Meat, Kyle's favorite cartoon growing up, which was Disney's edgy but family-friendly version of Ren and Stimpy. After the pilot short rap production, Kyle started getting more work as a storyboard revisionist on projects like Danger Rangers, a one-season animated series about anther animals teaching kids safety lessons through the power of music videos. It's very early 2000s, down to the extreme sports, chunky outlines, and hyper-saturated colors. Danger Rangers aired on PBS from September 5th until December 26, 2006, with reruns technically spanning until September 2012. 
It boasted a surprisingly huge roster of voice actors, with the main cast including heavy hitters like Mark Hamill, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Gray Griffin. Oh, damn, that's a pretty stellar cast for a public access TV show. Check it out, kids. You need to stay away from hot surfaces like this stove. And grown-ups have to make sure pot handles are turned to the back of the stove. Ooh, good one. That way, you won't accidentally knock a pot down onto little ones nearby. Oh, shit! Get the fuck out of here! What are you doing? Go! Get the fuck out of here, you stupid idiot! However, Danger Rangers fell into obscurity after a messy internal lawsuit from investors who accused the production company, Educational Adventures, of fraud and financial mismanagement. I couldn't find much in the way of public documentation for it, you know, excluding this article from News 14 Carolina. But there was a lot of that going on around the Great Recession, so it wouldn't shock me. After that, Kyle took on storyboard revisionist work for a game series on the PS Vita, Mod Nation Racers, and its sequel in 2007 and 2009 respectively. But things really took off once Kyle accepted a storyboard artist position on the Disney Channel TV show Fish Hooks. It followed the adventures of B, Milo, and Oscar, three teenage fish classmates who attend high school together. Y you get it? Fish, school, F fish swimming schools, you catch them on hooks? I get it! <clears throat> anyway, Fish Hooks ran from September 3rd, 2010 to April 4th, 2014. It was modestly popular for Disney as a series. But more importantly, it brought in Kyle's LA network in a noticeable way. Working at one of the biggest animation studios in LA put him on the radar of showrunners like Alex Hirsch and Craig McCracken. This led to new storyboarding positions on hot-ticket animated projects of the early 2010s, including Bravest Warriors, Fanboy and Chum Chum, Wander Over Yonder, and Clarence. Kyle's versatility seemed to be a major asset in how frequently he was brought on to new projects, especially within different studios using completely different styles. Look, I cannot stress enough how much this dude was hustling during the mid-2010s, sometimes working on five shows at once. Additionally, Kyle was avidly developing his own TV series, with two characters he had created back in the mid-1990s. The original series premise followed two wannabe hero siblings looking for quests as temp jobs. He pitched the show between two studios back-to-back -back in the mid-2000s. First to Cartoon Network as Legendary Warriors for Hire, then with Mondo Media as Dungeons and Day Jobs respectively. But both studios rejected his pitch as it lacked the right je ne sais quoi to draw their attention completely. Kyle had to go back to the drawing board to make it more engaging. Inspiration struck once Kyle found a creative way to incorporate a magical gimmick into the series. Namely, an absurd number of themed swords for the characters to interact with. <laughs> Can you tell he likes playing JRPG video games? Because that is JRPG logic. With that, Cartoon Network finally saw potential in his show, now called Mighty Magiswords, and signed a development contract in 2013. I felt like the thing I was missing was a hook, and uh, the sword was the hook that I eventually came up with. And, you know, I like an element like that because it kind of adds to... kind of adds a visual element of cartoon fun to the whole thing, instead of being, you know, more of a regular swords and sorcery type of tale. Now, the original deal for Mighty Magiswords was honestly pretty unique for a new Cartoon Network property. It was being developed specifically for a new app called CN Anything and was designed to have micro-content short-form videos and clips of their most popular shows for smartphones and tablets. Because if you can't stop chronic ADHD in children, you learn to profit from it. The app was formally launched on May 6, 2015, and Mighty Magiswords was their first original programming for it, comprising 15-second mini-episodes. But these videos had a unique twist. Combining a choose-your-own-adventure element with an interactive choice between two swords that would lead to a different episode ending. And since kids are notorious for burning through content absurdly fast, 
Kyle and his production team created dozens of shorts to utilize this replayability aspect. Choose your Magisword. Rad Rocket Magisword. You've becrammed all of my styles. I'll be safe up here in the speed lines. Boundaries! Rob Sorcher, Cartoon Network's then chief content officer, saw this wacky new show as their attempt at making cartoons more interactive for a tech-savvy audience. As quoted in an interview with Cartoon Brew, he stated, quote, Mighty Magisort is custom created for the way young audiences consume media today. This is about how stories can be told in new ways and how a community can play together. End quote. <laughs> was it a gimmick? Yeah, it was. And a very transparent one at that. But at least they were pretty straightforward to produce. Eventually, Cartoon Network asked Kyle to create 10 three minute long Magic Sword shorts, which soon evolved into five minute long episodes. And once those continued to perform well on the app, Cartoon Network decided to option Mighty Magic Swords into a full series, with each episode running 11 minutes long. Kyle wore many hats working on Mighty Magic Swords, but especially during the longer episodes. There's literally no separating the art from the artist on this one. They are one and the same. His duties included executive producer, writing, music, composition, character design, as well as providing most of the male character voices, including the main male character lead, Prohias, with Gray Griffin providing the voice of his sister, Vamber. Our lead characters are your standard pair of goofy but unlucky siblings. Prohias is more impulsive and eager to fight, with Vamber being the slightly smarter one. But she hates wearing pants, I guess? <laughs> I'm getting pretty tired of this no-pants criticism. I hate pants. I hate them. I feel like I can't even move in them. They make my skin crawl. And as my brother, I will ask you to stop judging my bare legs decision and accept me for who I am. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, this show is really not making it easier for me to talk about it seriously. Anyway, uh, they're always low on cash and trying to make ends meet by taking on Quest. Most of the villagers in their town of Riboflavin? Riboflavin. I watched the show. I just couldn't recall the name of the town. Well, well, the folks who live in this town justifiably hate them for causing so much havoc and destruction. But that's not going to slow down their constant pursuit of finding new Magiswords. Now, I watched a few episodes of these different formats during my research to get an idea of how this style of storytelling would translate between each runtime, which honestly was a tougher process than I would have thought. For those who don't remember, Mighty Magiswords was one of the 25 shows included in the Great HBO Max Cartoon Purge of 2022. So the only way you can legally watch it is through buying partial seasons on Google Play. Yep, that, that's it. That's all they got. Legally. Otherwise, there are still some archive backups of clips and shorts on YouTube. At, at least for now. But as a series, how is it overall? In terms of strengths, I think it definitely benefits the most with character design. The color theory used with the characters can be nice too, as I really like the contrast of Vamber's hair and costume. Like, I'd be shocked if they weren't at least vaguely inspired by Lupin the Third, since Kyle is obsessed with the anime. Mostly though, many of the character color choices are a mix of garish, saturated tones that certainly grab your attention, but not always in a pleasant way. Honestly, my biggest issue with it was how needlessly fast each character interaction is. It's a constant overwhelming flaw throughout Mighty Magic Swords as a property. But it's especially noticeable within the three to five minute segments. Five minutes is a pretty short amount of time, relatively speaking. But with the right pacing, you can still make a compelling story if you use it wisely. And they did not. Instead, it's more like they put a bunch of text-heavy, condensed comic book panels sandwiched right after the other that have absolutely no breathing room for atmosphere or reaction time. Like, it's Sonic Adventure 2 levels of bad dialogue pacing. 
Because if any of the characters stop talking, well, they're obviously going to lose your kid's attention, and we clearly can't risk that happening. Here, check out this clip from their mini-episode, Walkies, and you'll see what I mean. So when's the rent due? Tomorrow! What? What the heck are we gonna do? We'll get tossed down on our Buddha kisses by Mr. Packard for sure! We will just have to take the first job that comes along. Opportunity knocks! Why are they talking so damn fast? Normal people don't talk like this, unless they're professional auctioneers at a county fair. <laughs> Critical reviews of the show were middling to bad. One that I think sums it up pretty nicely is on Common Sense Media, a nonprofit website that reviews family-oriented media for kids and parents. They're basically a content filter to find positive morales or educational value in movies and TV. As quoted in their review, writer Emily Ashby stated, quote, Mighty Magisaurus is an assault on the senses, even more so in its full-length format, as opposed to the shorts that started the show. The longer episodes also become tedious to watch as the plot gets lost in the visual action. End quote. Yeah, that was definitely my experience watching it too. Everyone is yelling and throwing things. Meanwhile, I'm curled up in a ball, plugging my ears and waiting for it to be over. Mighty Magiswords aired a total of 91 episodes for two seasons, running from August 15th, 2016 to May 17th, 2019. It had a relatively niche fandom compared to the heavy hitters in Cartoon Network at the time, including Steven Universe, We Bear Bears, and Gumball. But it did acquire some dedicated fans, including one in particular who took their affinity for the creator to an obsessive level. During the series' production, Kuroza was fending off the attention of a disturbed fan and stalker named Linkar Rocks, aka Luis Kendall. He's gone by many dumb pseudonyms online, including the Toy Taker and Mix Master Media, but his behavior has always been the same. He's a complete hack who tried to cozy up to folks in the animation industry to get jobs in high profile shows. But he has absolutely no talent and applied for them using stolen animation test and artwork. Linkar's preferred method for doing this was blackmail through one account after targeting a specific artist, but then feigning ignorance and giving emotional support for the same artist on another sock puppet account. One situation involved him trying to scam his way into testing for hell of a boss using stolen artwork, all the while leaking paywelled material from Viv's Patreon. However, a member of Viv's team noticed the style of the work Linkar provided as being none other than Kyle Carrozza's storyboarding work. Linkar doesn't seem to have a single original bone in his body, a seemingly basing his entire online persona off of anybody else unfortunate enough to make his line of sight. And yeah, one of them happened to be Kyle, right down to making a carbon copy of his website. Luis has been consistently stalking and harassing Carosa for over half a decade, starting sometime around 2014. At one point he would do this through interviews. He would constantly make new identities and email addresses to ask Kyle questions under the guise of an interview. When Kyle responded, he would continuously ask more questions to keep the interaction going, endlessly dragging the conversation on forever. Eventually, Kyle stopped responding to him. But the creepy persistence of this guy was hard to ignore, as he targeted many of the other artists who worked on Magiswords, pretending to interview them, but actually pumping them for information about why Kyle blocked him. For the sake of time, I can't get into the complete history of this scandal as it gets pretty wild, but I highly recommend checking out fellow YouTubers Bernie Vids and Izzy, who have done some fantastic deep dive videos about him. They were phenomenally helpful when it came to doing research on this section, so please send them some love. Now, I really wish Kyle's story ended here, as a quirky go-getter who pulled himself up by the bootstraps and rose up the ranks towards creating his own show, that all of his hard work resulted in a happy resolution, and he's now a cherished creator who still has to deal with some of the trappings of fame. But unfortunately, that is not the case and Kyle would commit some heinous acts that would eventually lead to his devastating downfall. Like most artists these days, 
Kyle is pretty online and interactive with his fans and fellow artists. But being a public figure on a public forum, he uses social media accounts to voice his opinions on the state of animation and art being shared. This started all the way back in the mid-2000s, as he started to build a following online on websites like DeviantArt. At first, Kyle set his sights against disgraced former Ren and Stimpy showrunner John Kay. Apparently, John made some disparaging remarks against Kyle's art style on his blog, citing it as more of his opinion of, quote, not what to do for cute character designs. Uh, sidebar, uh, literally imagine actually valuing John Kay's opinion enough to respond to it. My god, why would you do that to yourself? Uh, growing up, Kyle did seem to have some affinity towards the Spumco animation style, at least during their early work on Mighty Mouse and Beanie and Cecil. Looking at his overall style, I think it's hard to deny that there's at least some influence there. His former mentor, Brian Mitchell, got to start working for Spomco after all. Based on the header for Kyle's ancient portfolio website, he even used to email John Kay for advice and art critiques. Back in the long, long ago, Kyle used to make pretty frequent common disclaimers, asking people to stop comparing him to Spumco, specifically John Kay and how hard he fell off after the downfall of Red and Stimpy. As quoted on an old journal entry on DeviantArt, Kyle stated, quote, Look, folks, I know when you say it, you intend it to be a compliment. But please stop telling me my work looks like John Kay's. If you compare my current work to his current work, it's not all that similar. John left behind appealing drawings, expressions that make sense, and funny writing years ago. The only real similarities to John's style I really exhibit is my fondness for Bob Clampett Looney Tunes style character drawing and my use of color lines. End quote. Sure, Jan. But once Kyle got a larger following online, the style comparisons kept coming. Rather than ignore it, though, he instead made a post mocking John Kay on his webcomic, Frog, Raccoon, Strawberry. It was originally published on May 27th, 2011, but later uploaded to Webtoons on November 23rd, 2022. Ironically, it was first posted way before the news of John's own issues came to light publicly in 2018. But it certainly aged poorly knowing what we know now about both of them. <laughs> Methinks thou doth protest too much, mutton chop man. As his following grew, Kyle became very publicly outspoken with his dislike of lollycon and similar taboo art styles. For those who are not familiar with the term, let's just say it's a... <laughs> now, the timeline behind this is a little complicated, but I'll do my best to make it as linear as possible. But I think it's important to have a solid foundation of context before getting into all of, you know, that. One incident adjacent to this involved the online activity of a former Mighty Magisword storyboard artist known as Ange. Kyle had originally brought them onto the show as a freelance storyboard artist during season one, to later have them start working full time during season two as a storyboard revisionist. Leading up to this point, Ange had gone through a number of mental and physical health issues as a result of trauma from childhood sexual assault, among more recent issues. They stated that, per their recommendation of their therapist, if true, one outlet for venting their pent-up emotions was drawing Shoda art, featuring cartoon characters under an alias on a private Twitter account. Now, I really don't want to have to describe this term, but okay, uh, fine, I have to. Shoda art refers to adult material featuring cartoon characters, specifically young boy characters. One of the pairings they would draw Rule 34 of was Frankie Foster and Mac from Foster's Home, or Zim and Dib from Invader Zim. <laughs> now, I don't really think this is the best approach for dealing with that kind of trauma personally, but hey, that's just me. And I also, again, have my suspicions if the therapist approved this. That just does not sound likely to me. Either way, uh, that was the situation, and that's how they were dealing with processing it. According to their later released 156-page public manifesto, 
So fine, whatever. The important thing was Ange was creating it under a private 18 plus account alias, independent of their public facing Twitter. Because obviously, uh, most folks online would not want to see that kind of thing, specifically employers and colleagues. However, uh, specific employers and colleagues did end up seeing it, namely Kyle Carroza and some members of his inner circle. And his work had finished on Mighty Magiswords years prior. But one way or another, their alt account had been sent to Kyle anonymously in late February of 2021. And believed it was the work of two of their former friends, Holly and Jay, who had leaked it to Kyle to discredit and kink shame them publicly. The reasons behind why they would do this are really complicated and difficult to stomach. By the way, I did not have a good time researching this part at all. But long story short, it mostly boils down to good old fashioned infighting, love bombing, stalking, pro shipping versus anti shipping discourse, moral grandstanding, and toxic friendships. You know, wholesome stuff like that. It's the kind of thing that only makes sense if you're terminally online enough to understand half the terms I just said. Anyway, after confronting Ange privately and clearly stating he was cutting ties with them, Kyle had sent their account to nine of his friends and colleagues. This was, ostensibly, to warn them of Ange's After Dark account, that he found it disturbing, and was distancing himself from them, personally and professionally. But this matter did not stay private, as someone had leaked this info onto the Twitter grapevine, and made Ange's life a living hell, with others watching the resulting carnage and glee. The response was so overwhelming and swift that Ange nearly ended their own life, suffering additional health complications and being hospitalized for some time afterwards. Now, I want to be clear about something here. I really don't like any of the people involved in this situation. Not to sound too blunt, but the majority of my research for this section was just attempting to compare one person's statements over the other, looking for any kind of consistencies between them. Instead, what I found was a slew of back and forth accusations and smear campaigns that were more exhausting than illuminating. Consider yourself lucky that this is the short version, because the deeper details of it get even worse. I would not recommend that you look into it independently, though. Every justification I saw that the people involved provided felt more like crabs in a bucket tearing each other down, rather than actual accountability. That is my opinion and my perception of the events as an outside observer. Either way, news of this situation spread like wildfire on the internet, with folks choosing sides as many were fighting against Kyle and his inner circle for effectively doxing Ange and blacklisting them. The optics were out of control, with the controversy following Kyle and his inner circle everywhere they went. The internet does not forget, and his most outspoken critics were eager to enact some kind of justice and retaliation. Well, their opportunity came two years later, when the organizers at Yumacon, an anime convention in Detroit, announced Kyle as one of the featured guests for 2023. Users were furious and pummeled their social media replies with demands of forcing him to drop out of the con. At first, Yumacon defended their decisions, hiding the Twitter replies and citing Andrew's responses as only one side of the story. But due to an overwhelming public backlash and threats of boycotts, the organizers eventually relented and removed him from the guest list two weeks before the convention began. But Kyle's reputation had preceded him, and it only got worse from there. Kiwi Farms had started keeping tabs on him on a thread after the Ange incident happened. Various online sources indicated that Kyle's online protests were nothing more than virtue signaling. They detailed he had a history of grooming new talent brought on Mighty Magiswords, along with groping accusations, soliciting nude photos from girls on DeviantArt, even getting into dirty text message chains with former employees. And yeah, <laughs> he was married while much of this was going on. Wow, you know, if true, whew, that's, that's pretty bad. A further speculation came from eagle-eyed users on Twitter. After Kyle publicly announced that his Google account had been taken down, 
having created a new one for rehosting his old videos. What's weird about this is it wasn't a simple rebrand for a new email being used instead. Rather, he posted about it being borked or not working properly on Twitter on September 13th, 2023. And this is very important to note, as Google does not take down user accounts unless they find specific material on them, namely illegal images with embedded hash information in the file's code. These hashes work similarly to a digital fingerprint, and when a file is shared in mass, they can be tracked down and cross-referenced when they're hosted on a Google account more easily. So, if a shared file with the same hash information shows up during a content scan by Google, the account is flagged and taken down immediately. This most commonly happens with CSIM, or Child Sexual Exploitation Material. It's the more clinical but accurate name for CP. Based on the accounts of Newgrounds user Spilezug, who was a family friend of his, Kyle was subscribed to Google One which functions as a sizable backup hard drive service for files and data. He allegedly used this service for storing the majority of his digital files and information through their cloud services. So even if an illegal material folder had been accidentally auto-synced onto the server and removed immediately afterward, Google would have flagged the account automatically anyway and put it under investigation. Now, there's a chance of false positives, but with a network as interconnected as Google's content filtering? <laughs> I really doubt it. From that point on, there was a nine-month lapse of activity until Kyle A. Carosa was officially arrested at his home on June 20th, 2024, at 7.30 a.m. Pacific Time. He was formally charged with possession of over 600 images of CSIM per an investigation by ICAC, or the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force program. Kyle was finally caught. Now, this is a lot to take in, obviously. So I'll wrap things up now in my overall impressions of this whole debacle, along with what lessons there are to take from it. The American animation industry is relatively small, especially in a hub like LA, where most of the biggest companies are based out of many people can end up working on the same show or film at one studio, and then cross paths with the same artist on a different production shortly thereafter. Working artists frequently build their network by talking and sharing their experiences with other showrunners and creatives. Sometimes it makes working on a production that much more enjoyable because you know each other's strengths. But there's a flip side to this where artists warn each other to avoid working with a creative lead, producer, or showrunner due to the working conditions or their treatment of the staff on another production. That kind of reputation can follow someone for a while, but consequences from it can take forever to really come to light. Now, there can be a clear benefit to this. We would not have the downfall of creeps like Dan Schneider and his abusive work environments without the former actors and crew bravely speaking out against him, or exposing clearly deranged obsessive fans like Linkar Rocks to warn other artists to avoid interacting with them. But in a fiercely competitive industry like animation, people can exploit and abuse that insight to their own advantage. And I believe that was the case with Kyle, at least based on what I found researching the situation. In my experience, abusive people like Kyle have a few things in common, regardless of what industry or organization they operate in. To start, they are bottom feeders, and this term has a dual meaning. They usually target people who are at their lowest. This means their targets might be experiencing an emotional or physical or mental low point in their lives. Uh, simply put, they usually go after people who are going through a rough patch in life, like recovering after a recent breakup, or losing a family member or friend, or moving to a new place and not knowing anyone. A career in action, or financial troubles, health or self-esteem issues, that kind of stuff. Now, that's not always the case, but typically, abusive people target folks struggling through some kind of vulnerable circumstances. 
and bait them by offering a form of support or a way out. At first, they can even seem genuine and come across as altruistic. But there is always a catch, even if it takes a while to come to the surface. They're also bottom feeders and that their targets are generally lower on the totem pole in terms of social influence, work hierarchies, or experience levels. Namely, they don't go after somebody their own size or bigger because they're cowards. They are people who want to hide behind their network, their position at a company, their bankability to a studio, or their online following to strike down any claims countering how they present themselves to others, especially on a public forum like social media. Secondly, they're hypocrites, some to a more extreme sense than others. Uh, Kyle is definitely in the former camp. He put on a public facade of being intensely against Lollicon, which most people on the internet are, and he weaponized that fact. But in private, he had his own repulsive collection of CP while going on a personal crusade against someone else, even compelling his fans to dogpile on them or silence his critics. Despite his best efforts, Carl Carosa now has a startling amount of things in common with John Kay, with the least concerning of them being his visual art style. Working at three of the biggest animation studios in LA would logically mean he'd overlap with quite a few of the same people on different projects. Kyle was well connected enough to have a number of people in his network that would never experience this kind of behavior from him, whether they were peers or higher ups at the company. A wide variety of former collaborators and acquaintances have only known him as the goofy, wacky showrunner who loved making cartoons and music. But privately, he would shame others for posting underage material while knowingly having his own bad habits to cover up. So once this news broke online, there was a wide variety of responses coming out, including disbelief, disgust, and vindication. Whatever behavior abusers like Kyle enact tends to have a cloak of plausible deniability, with the worst of it usually being done behind closed doors. This is because they know it's wrong, or at the very least, socially unacceptable, and want to avoid having any witnesses validating their victim story. So if anything comes to light, the public-facing argument becomes more about whose word you trust over the other. Or, well, he never treated me like that, so I don't buy these allegations. There is a deliberate smokescreen tactic, as they know how to turn it off and on like a switch. Plus, they're generally diligent enough to cover up any incriminating evidence to try and control their target with private threats, being blacklisted or passive-aggressive tactics like social isolation. That is why these patterns of abuse can continue for so long and why it can take a while for survivors to come forward. Lastly, abusers like Kyle are arrogant. They allow the success of their professional careers to inflate their egos and cloud what judgment they have left into justifying their own bad behavior. They treat other people as a means to an end or as a resource to be exploited for their own gain. This can range from attention, money, influence, connections, sex, job opportunities. If it can be commoditized, they'll find a way to do it. The easiest way to maintain this is by seeking out people who reaffirm their own self-perceptions and violently reject anyone or any criticism that threatens it by whatever means necessary. We've seen this in how Kyle responds to most pieces of criticism leveled towards his work, even back during the deviant art era. Out of context, this response defending his work on the Powerpuff Girls reboot has a new yikes quality to it. A compounding that were the caricatures of two of his biggest critics, Amit Amidi and John Kay. Kyle might try to brush off these depictions as John Barry's ideas, his collaborator for the comic. But ultimately, Kyle was the one who drew them. If he really felt that uncomfortable talking about them, I figured he could tell John that and do a different storyline. 
Instead, it comes across as, screw you, payback, that reads more as an immature retort to a pissing contest. What's unusual about this situation is that Carl was arrested about a month before the news broke publicly. Cartoon Brew released their article during the evening of July 13th, 2024, during an already crazy news week. They also chose quite possibly the least flattering picture they could for the headline. But considering it was written by the publisher and editor-in-chief Amit Amiti, who clearly did not forget about the disparaging comic, yeah, I'd say it was personal, but not unexpected. Kyle fucked around and he found out. And a month later, so did everybody else online. That's why I find it so weird that the core discussion involved in this story revolves around the contrast of exploitation material. At least that's how things snowballed to this point. A literal fantasy versus reality situation between cartoons and pictures depicting illegal material. The repercussions involved with both of these should be, you know, pretty obvious. But here we are. There's no one really to root for here because they're all unreliable narrators with their own shitty baggage and agendas. To me, they seem like former co-workers who, for one reason or another, hate each other and rant endlessly about their grievances online. The only people I have sympathy for are his former victims who have been waiting for him to come to justice for ages now, to finally get their own retribution. The folks who were legitimately blindsided by Kyle's duplicitous nature. There can be many facets to someone's personality. You can be close friends with someone for years and never truly experience anything close to the horror stories shared by the victims. But just because it did not happen to you does not mean that those experiences should not be taken seriously. And luckily, Kyle has been publicly disavowed by many of his former collaborators and friends who now see him for what he really is. I honestly don't know the best way to vet people entering into the animation industry. But one thing I do know is that there are too many capable and talented people working in animation who shouldn't have to tolerate dog shit treatment from serial offenders. They've become the missing stare, the parasites that have firmly wedged themselves into positions of power that you have to avoid if you want to survive. Typically, people who are perpetrating on others as adults have a history or pattern of abuse. But no one has to tolerate abuse, and everyone has the right to report it. If it rises to the level of breaking a law or threatening someone's safety, I don't want victims being threatened into silence or falsely blacklisted, only to share their stories of creepy behavior from the same person with other survivors years after the fact. That shouldn't come with the territory, and I don't think that's an overly idealistic statement either. There has to be a way to instill some kind of system of checks and balances. Like not in the flippant HR kind of way where it's only there to protect the company. Actual change. And some way of preventing this level of abuse from happening so frequently from an interpersonal level. People in the industry can't keep looking the other way or turning a blind eye. Sooner or later, they will be face to face with a mirror questioning why they refused to do something to help when they could have. In situations like this, I found that nobody really believes you until it happens to them. They might be sympathetic, but they can't truly understand how you feel until they receive the same kind of treatment from the same person or someone like them. But from the looks of it, Kyle has screwed over a lot of people to get to where he is now. At the very least, enough of them to warrant creating mirrored archives of his old videos, gaming channel, and social media posts. Uh, by the way, uh, these were absolutely integral to completing the research for this video. So thank you to the folks online who cared enough to not let this kind of information fall through the cracks. There's one thing I also want to mention within this section. 
because I've noticed it consistently comes up whenever a new scandal happens involving a notable cartoon producer. I usually see a bunch of tweets or social media posts that promote unproblematic creators as people to champion for instead. But I still think this is the wrong approach to have. Putting other creators on a pedestal is an inherently flawed idea, even if it is well-intentioned. Because those creators have their own issues, just like everybody else. Realistically, not to something this extreme, golly, I hope not, but trying to set them up as infallible role models in the animation community isn't healthy either. I think this keeps happening because there's a troubling sense of behavioral purity that is overtaking a lot of social media platforms lately. And I think it's setting up an impossible standard for other people to exist by. I do think there's a limit between people making genuine mistakes and learning from them with people making the same mistakes over and over again, showing an obvious pattern of behavior. But one does not always equal the other. In the case of Kyle Carosa, the evidence is clearly there, and there is no excuse or justification if he is guilty. I actually asked my relative if, you know, looking at the case, if there's a chance of him being innocent, and they told me, yeah, no, there's <laughs> 600 images found on Google. No, he's done for. This man is guilty, most likely, like 99.999% chance. But, you know, again, this is a, a government where it is innocent until proven guilty, but the chances of that happening, that's a far cry. I digress. I think this is an instance of someone who gets into a position of power, feels untouchable, and uses that as an excuse to enact their own sort of retribution on their colleagues, no matter how petty or misplaced it is. Uh, during the immediate aftermath of this story breaking, a lot of folks online were making superficial claims that based on his physical appearance, Kyle must be a creep. I mean, like, right? Look at him. He's fat and he's got mutton chops. He has to be a pedophile, right? Jokes aside, uh, to me, it's those kinds of flippant statements that allow conventionally attractive abusers to perpetrate their own crimes uninterrupted. Like, let's not forget that serial killers like Ted Bundy and Richard Ramirez got their own legion of followers for being marginally attractive, despite the heinous crimes they committed. So making a connection between physical appearance and perceived trustworthiness is a false dilemma. That logic works with cartoon villains, not real people. However, I am completely fine with judging him based on his actions and they happen to include possession of at least 600 images of child sexual exploitation material. And yes, that was the official amount per the Burbank Police Department reports. That whole entire like 16 terabytes thing was just a troll lying on the Cartoon Network Wikipedia. So, you know, stop spreading that BS around. That's misinformation. It's un still, any amount is too much, but it's 600 images and that is still very horrific. For some advertiser-friendly visual contrast, that would be the equivalent of every single Animal Crossing amiibo card released in the US, plus 93 additional images. Nobody gets to a collection of anything of that volume as a mistake or a lapse of judgment. You have to go looking for it. So after his arrest, Kyle spent three days in jail and posted a surety bond of $75,000 on June 27th, 2024. But he's still awaiting the preliminary court hearing, which, as of writing this, is set for August 30th, 2024 in Burbank, California. That could be subject to change, but my hope is that it's definitely sooner rather than later. All of his social media accounts have been nuked, with the only straggler remaining as his locked Twitter account presumably uh, so he can keep searching his name for more shit to hit the fan in the days leading up to then. Uh, during this time, he is at a minimum on three years probation and has to register as a sex offender. But yeah, that's absolutely not good enough for me or any of the people he hurts. Seeing all of this at a glance isn't validating or comforting. 
It's more disgusting that things got to this extent in the first place. So my hope in publicizing this video is that it encourages his past victims and witnesses to come forward and testify to ensure he receives actual jail time for his crimes. He has more than earned it by this point, and his victims deserve to get some vindication for all they went through. I hate talking about a situation like this because the information behind it is so repellent to me that I'm trying to compartmentalize everything surrounding it. To approach this from as close to a factual standpoint as much as I can. So I will close things out on this video with a very fitting quote by journalist and author Robert Caro. Quote, Although the cliché says that power always corrupts, what is seldom said is that power always reveals. When a man is climbing, trying to persuade others to give him power, concealment is necessary. But as a man obtains more power, camouflage becomes less necessary. End quote. So, if you or someone you know has experienced this kind of abuse and is struggling to process it, Please know it's not your fault, and you are not alone. I've provided some resources in the description of this video for anyone who needs help. They have a network of local advocates for support and a contact line to report anonymous tips. Uh, hopefully, with proper checks and balances, communication, and accountability, cases like Kyle Carroza, John Kay, and Julia Vickerman will become a thing of the past. The industry deserves better. People deserve better. For Kyle, me and my team will continue to monitor the court case and what comes of it. According to my relatives who work on the justice system, there's an extremely high likelihood that Kyle will be put into prison considering the digital trail of evidence. But only time will tell. If guilty, which he most likely is, here's hoping Kyle is thrown behind bars and serves as a reminder to anyone who would dare use their power to hurt others. Uh, real quick, folks, in the Patreon outro here, I want to thank my writer, Tracy, for making this video. She did the majority of the research and the writing. Uh, she did amazing. Um, we both went into the pits of darkness on this one, but it was Tracy who did the heavy lifting. So thank you so much for your work. Uh, a shout out again to the charity Darkness to Light. Uh, the link to that charity is in the description. And again, um, shout out to my relatives who work in the justice system. They do just that incredible work that is like the hope that we need in society to keep going for advocating for children and victims of sexual abuse. So this was a hard hitting video, folks. Thanks for watching it. Um, here's to a more lighthearted video next next time and to a better tomorrow. Hey folks, thanks for making it to the end of the video. For this week's indie spotlight, I would like to recommend Punked Pooch. This is an animated short from the animation school Seneca College's YouTube channel. I think it's cool that they got a YouTube channel to upload this stuff. That's awesome. Uh, by the way, check out the description of the pilot for a full list of artists and animators who worked on the pilot, plus a bunch of other animated shorts on the channel. Now for Punk Pooch, we follow a band of anthro dog girls and get caught up in some friend drama. This Doberman girl is a diva and screwed over this poodle girl and said poodle girl is not going to stand for it anymore. Doggy pal! You ruined the band, bitch, how could you? The story is simple yet effective, but my biggest praise of all are the character designs. You could have fooled me that this pilot was pitched in the mid-2000s as a concept for Oh Yeah Cartoon. Kind of like a, a high, high, puffy on me Yumi vibe with its stylization. Also, Borizoi Dog is best dog, no contest. Look at that snoot. All in all, I believe that there's a lot of potential here based on the character designs alone. They are just that distinct and pleasing to the eye. Maybe we'll get more, but check out the animated short for yourself at the very least. Once again, folks, thanks for watching this video, and I will see you all next time.